the institute focuses on eight research topics climate change and energy global governance sustainable development and smart cities refugee and migration china's belt and road initiative border and transboundary water politics indo pacific affairs disaster management and international economy and development previously nice has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe it was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at nice it's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you but thank you anyway and i certainly admire the work that you're doing uh i'm very happy to be with you all nice global conclave is the flagship event of the nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement nepal the theme of the three day conference is connecting nepal to the world by bringing leaders diplomats business leaders and scholars from all around the globe the objective of the conclave is to introduce nepal to the world and at the same time update the nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast changing geopolitics which will help nepal reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal this is the second session of the conference and to chair and moderate this session it's a real pleasure to have with us professor s t muni professor s t muni is a professor emeritus to jawaharlal nehru university and member of the executive council of manohar parikar institute for defense studies and analysis he has taught at several universities he served as india good morning good afternoon and so please continue with the session Professor Muni, please take over the floor. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity, Pramod, and thanks to your institute for organizing this mega event. We have this session on India's neighborhood first policy. Uh, we have a very eminent panel, and I don't uh, intend to introduce them because it would really be. um uh, i mean it, it 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 would not be doing a favor to them by introducing because they are so well known uh, all over the world not only in india and south asia moreover uh, their introduction is in in the in the book big book of uh, of this session i will just take 2 minutes to introduce the subject india's neighborhood first is integral to india's foreign policy as a result at any stage of time neighborhood priorities are very much on india's foreign policy nehru and indira gandhi had very extended and intense engagement with the neighbors atal bihari vajpayee ji uh, wanted to create a south asian community of the neighbors indira kumar gujral gave a doctrine of uh, a neighborhood uh, policy which said no reciprocity india would be showing and therefore india is willing to accommodate them as far as possible prime minister modi has articulated in a very impressive manner and uh, with lot of fanfare in 2014 uh, which raised lot of hopes around that india's uh, approach to the neighbors would now be radically different unfortunately the policy on ground uh, tumbled down for various reasons in in case of some of the countries particularly pakistan nepal sri lanka and maldives uh therefore there has gone a bit of a rethinking on the content of the policy not on its structure and framework and so far as content is concerned i am uh, of the view that now what we are witnessing is neighborhood 2.0 uh why why and we have drawn certain india has drawn certain lessons out of it uh because firstly uh, the neighborhood first in the first phase got mixed up with india first as a result there were some problems with 
some of the neighbors, as I mentioned, there was a lot of turbulence in the neighboring countries, which reoriented their own policies towards India. And thirdly, very strong push by China, which created problems in neighborhood uh, first policy. Now we are witnessing uh, neighborhood 2.0 and uh, I leave it at there for uh, the experts to educate us and enlighten us on these issue. Uh, we have very little time. Uh, I am told eight to nine minutes. Let me say 10 minutes uh, each of the participant because one hour we will take in uh, panelists presentations and then a question answer. Uh, I will request you kindly to stick to the time and don't force me to remind you that time is going out. Uh, may I now uh, begin with uh, uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, who is the Director General of the Vivekananda International Foundation, a very well known figure uh, in uh, India's strategic community and I would say very well acknowledged and recognized globally as an expert on strategic affairs in India. Dr. Gupta, please. Unmute yourself, please. Organizers, please unmute Dr. Yeah, Arvind yeah. Gupta. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Moni, for giving me the floor. And uh, I want to start uh, with a uh, big thank you to uh, Pramod for inviting me to this uh, enclave and also congratulating him for uh, uh, organizing such a massive uh, mega event. And I think uh, we're all proud that uh, you have been able to do so, uh, particularly so because uh, we know each other and uh, I can see several people from the IDSA here, and you have worked with them uh, there earlier. And uh, it's nice to link up with you in your new avatar as a, a head of the NICE and also uh, someone who is providing a platform for this interaction. Uh, neighborhood 2.0, that is the name uh, Professor Muni has given. And I think it's a uh, very a provocative uh, uh, nomenclature. And uh, I defer to his uh, expertise on uh, 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 the neighborhood. And he has been a mentor to so many of us, tremendous uh, learning. And uh, when he says it's neighbor 2.0, I think we should certainly take it uh, uh, seriously. Uh, it is true that uh, uh, our neighborhood uh, uh, is evolving and uh, the uh, regional and the global environment uh, is changing uh, very rapidly. So it will have a tremendous impact on, uh, on, this, on South Asia as well. Uh, India has uh, already started adjusting to the major uh, changes that are taking place uh, uh, in our region and uh, globally. So it is uh, not surprising therefore that uh, we will have uh, uh, all countries uh, in the region who are also affected by these changes, uh, they would also uh, certainly uh, adjust their uh, policies. And as a result, whole of South Asia is going to be uh, impacted. Now, there are many factors which uh, impact uh, uh, South Asia, but uh, since the time is short, I'm going to uh, pick up uh, two major factors, which I would say are disruptors, uh, which are having an impact on uh, South Asia. One is uh, COVID. Uh, all of us are uh, struggling uh, to uh, cope with this uh, virus, and the virus is uh, amongst us. It has caused massive uh, disruptions in our different in our countries, respective countries, and uh, we do not know how the virus will evolve. There has been a tremendous uh, uh, loss of uh, life, uh, economic losses, livelihood losses, and uh, many people have been pushed down. Uh, below the poverty line. So gains of several few years uh, in improving livelihood and bringing people out of poverty, I think they have been undone. And it will take uh, several years for all of us to uh, come uh, uh, to recover uh, those gains. So I think that's a reality. But uh, COVID is also leading to a global uh, rebalancing. 
and uh, there are several aspects of uh, this uh, uh, rebalancing uh, one is that we are seeing now the return of uh, or the intensification i would say of uh, great power rivalries uh, with the rise of china and uh, with the clear articulation in the policies of the us that china and russia are uh, adversaries and uh, they have to deal with uh, them uh, that way uh, despite the both uh, Putin uh, Biden uh, summit so great power rivalries are going to return so how do they impact uh, south asia i think uh, that is something that uh, needs to be understood uh, india is of course uh, very much uh, impacted by these uh, uh, developments uh, china uh, the rise of china which uh, some years ago we were assured would be peaceful is anything but that uh so south asian countries uh, uh, which are under the sway of china's uh, belt and road initiative china pakistan economic corridor china myanmar economic corridor etc so many projects are there so how would south asian countries uh, deal with the china's rise and the rise is uh, anything but uh, peaceful in fact there are very clearly uh, aggressive and expansionist uh, 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 element to china's rise so this is something that uh, south asia will have to deal with it and i think uh, uh, in the galwan incident that happened uh, uh, last year and which has now resulted in a prolonged uh, standoff between india and china which still remains uh, unresolved and it has thrown up uh, many uh, uh, questions about uh, china's uh, behavior and some of these were discussed uh, in the last uh, inaugural session as well but uh, they have certainly a south asian flavor and uh, there are shades of uh, south china sea in uh, what is happening in uh, uh, south asia in so far as uh, uh, china is concerned so that is one point that i would like to uh, uh, put on the table here for the discussion uh, so these two disruptors disruptors the covid and uh, china i think they will have an impact on uh, on uh, south asia so now let me turn briefly to uh, uh, india's neighborhood uh, policy uh, it is uh, true that uh, india is i think looking uh, uh, at neighbors uh, with a, a fresh eye and i think the change this time is that uh, india is becoming uh, far more uh, specific in terms of dealing uh, with its neighbors so we have uh, uh, several policies which are actually uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the play uh, there is uh, uh, first that india is dealing with each country in south asia uh, on its merits that is i think uh, one uh, issue which is of course the bilateral component but the second is that uh, uh, in the neighborhood first policy there is a great deal of uh, emphasis on uh, connectivity and sub regional cooperation so that is the second element and i think india is paying a great deal of attention to uh, developing that aspect of uh, our uh, neighborhood policy much will depend upon whether india is able to deliver or not but i think indian policy makers are quite uh, conscious of the fact that delivery must be improved but the sheer uh, scope of india's neighborhood policy i think has uh, certainly gone up and i want to just uh, briefly outline uh, a few uh, data points uh, uh, and uh, for you for instance india's line uh, lines of credit to its neighbors have gone up from uh, about 3 billion dollars in 2014 to about 14 uh, 15 billion dollars in 2020 this is a figure which our, which our foreign secretary had given uh recently now of course one could uh, discuss whether line of credit is the best mode of uh, delivery etc but that is the direction in which uh, india has moved also india's trade with uh, uh, with uh, afghanistan bangladesh bhutan the maldives myanmar nepal sri lanka has increased uh, from about 19 billion in 2014 to about 26 billion 6 uh, years later uh which is uh, not uh, very uh, impressive but still it is showing some uh, uh, uh improvement uh sark of course is uh, uh, quite comatose but yet uh, prime minister modi made an effort to activate the sark during the covid and uh, 
uh, two meetings uh, have been held to promote uh, health cooperation amongst the SARC countries. But I think SARC is still uh, is not where the action really is. But India's own experience of dealing with the, the uh, COVID and also dealing with several developmental issues within the country, I think have some lessons for the uh, neighborhood. And uh, these, uh, uh, India can offer a lot of uh, cooperation, expertise, and uh, capacity building in these areas. India is emerging as a healthcare hub uh, for its uh, neighborhood. Though we have had, uh, we have some problems about vaccines now because we are ourselves shortage. But I think uh, within a, a few months, uh, these shortages will be overcome and we will have excess capacity to uh, share. Secondly, India's uh, uh, massive uh, uh, progress in uh, a, a solar powered uh, revolution and transition to clean energy, I think that is something, a lesson which uh, is there for all of us uh, and uh, how we should uh, uh, you know, work together in this area. And uh, this also links up with the issues of uh, climate change, et cetera. And this is something which is very relevant to South Asia. India has also taken uh, a number of steps to create power capacity. Uh, India uh, has created uh, 2,100 megawatt of hydropower capacity in Bhutan. Uh, this, I think, uh, uh, more can be created, but uh, certainly South Asian countries should look at this particular Nepal, uh, whether uh, there is uh, some possibility of uh, progress in uh, this area, creating more uh, clean energy, hydropower energy. Uh, India's grid, uh, I think this is a major uh, plus. Indian uh, grid is now connected to Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh, and interconnection with the Sri Lanka is under discussion. Once we have a uh, South Asia-wide uh, uh, electricity grid, I think it will uh, uh, certainly contribute to uh, uh, progress and development in the area. Uh, on the connectivity side, uh, I think, again, there are some major projects which have been implemented. Uh, India is promoting easier movement of hydrocarbons across the region and cross-border pipeline links between India and Nepal uh, have been, uh, are being built. Uh, another is being constructed between Siliguri and Japa, and there are many other such uh, examples. Uh, similarly, railways, Jayanagar, Kurta railway line and, uh, is already uh, working and uh, has been built, and Raksal Kathmandu railway line is on the uh, anvil. Uh, I think uh, uh, what is also important is that landlocked uh, countries like Bhutan, etc., can have access to the oceans and also. Uh, through the Indian inland waterways. So this is a big uh, uh, opportunity here for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal to work together. And uh, already uh, some positive uh, uh, outcomes are uh, visible. Uh, for instance, the connectivity between India and Bangladesh through the inland waterways is already uh, functioning and our Northeast has already uh, been uh, impacted. Uh, there are also now uh, is a direct uh, cargo ferry between India and Maldives. I think we should also look at uh, the uh, South Asia's connection with the other regions, one on the uh, Central Asia. Please, uh, and please conclude, Dr. Gupta. Yes, I'm just concluding in 30 seconds. And there are some major projects like the Chabahar port and uh, on the uh, connecting with the Central Asia and Afghanistan and also uh, with Southeast Asia. So the point is that uh, uh, though there can be some problems and there can be some historical uh, issues uh, between India and South Asia, there could be some old baggage. But once these connectivity projects and uh, interlinkages begin to show results, I think the uh, opportunities for uh, greater uh, cooperation will open up. And uh, this will help us uh, to deal with the disruptions uh, which have been caused by uh, COVID and also the rise of China. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. I'm sorry the time constraint is really weighing very heavily on us, but you have beautifully highlighted some of the very critical aspects of India's neighborhood policy. Thank you very much for uh, being straight on the points and enlightening uh, most of us. May I now uh, request Dr. Raghavan to kindly um, uh, share his thoughts on the subject? Thank you very much, Professor. Muni, and uh, may I at the beginning uh, congratulate Pramod and NICE for organizing uh, such a big uh, event. I've been associated with NICE in the past, and it's very good to see uh, how such a complex 
uh, event uh, involving so many speakers is being organized uh, so well. Uh, uh, time is brief and I thought I would share some thoughts uh, with regard to our uh, neighborhood and touch a little bit about uh, one country which is a critical part of our neighborhood, uh, which is uh, Pakistan. But the first question really to take off from what Professor Muni and uh, Dr. Gupta had uh, spoken about, which is about this question of neighborhood first versus uh, uh, India first. The fact is we live in an age where there are massive changes uh, uh, taking place, uh, in particular because of the rise of uh, China, uh, but also the larger disruptions which have taken place and people have spoken about the end of the era of globalization and the beginning of an era of deglobalization. Uh, the point is that we live in an age of uh, enhanced uh, nationalism. Uh, and although the world that we live in is much more inter inter interdependent, nevertheless, the rise of nationalism is a factor uh, which uh, cannot be discounted uh, in any country or in any uh, region. So the first question when one talks about our neighborhood or thinks about our neighborhood uh, is what constitutes national interest uh, in an age of uh, nationalism? And I, uh, I will leave these as questions, but it's something which I think about often when we look at uh, South Asia, given the extent of securitizing relationships uh, which have taken place in South Asia, uh, in the past uh, two or three uh, decades. So the first question which comes to mind is uh, to what extent is uh, national interest uh, composed uh, uh, or made up of national uh, security? Is national security the whole of national uh, interest? Now, this is a question which uh, in Pakistan they have grappled with not very successfully for many decades uh, now. Uh, but generally, what Pakistan's experience shows is the weaknesses of identifying national security wholly with uh, national uh, interest. The second question which comes to mind is, uh, is, is whether national interest the same as national prestige? And this is again a question which we grapple with uh, in South Asia uh, in particular, but also elsewhere in the world. That uh, does national prestige imply the same thing as national uh, interest or is national interest something more than that? And again, we have to look at uh, how we define national interest in an age of excessive securitization of uh, uh, relationships. Uh, I'll return to this very briefly in the end if there's time, but let me touch a little bit about uh, India-Pakistan uh, relations in the present uh, uh, context. Now, it is well known that uh, Relations between neighbors can often be very difficult and India-Pakistan relations are not an exception. There are many other examples uh, of this around the world. Uh, and certainly in our region in Asia, we have to look at the example of Japan uh, and China, where again, very complex, deeply divisive historical issues, which continue to suck so much oxygen out of the room uh, in contemporary Japan-China uh, relations. So India-Pakistan relations, uh, because of differences which cannot be reconciled and will never be reconciled, have followed a press and troughs uh, pattern. Uh, uh, in the foreseeable future, this press and troughs pattern will continue, an up and down uh, relationship. And we are in the midst of a transition point in this press and troughs uh, relationship. People who think that a downward spiral is going to continue to be downward for all times to come are as mistaken as those who think that when relations are an upswing, there will never be a downswing. The upswings and downswings are inevitable in India-Pakistan relations as they are in other relationships between uh, where there are difficulties in, uh, of history, of politics, of uh, uh, territorial issues which cannot be easily reconciled in other countries in the world. The challenge for diplomacy really is how do you dampen this up and down relation to reduce the extent of the downswing and use the upswings to prepare 
better for the downswings that will follow. That really is the challenge for Indian and Pakistani diplomacy. And it is an open question to what extent this up and down uh, the diplomacy has been successful in dampening these upswings uh, and uh, uh, downswings. Uh, the question also really is that when we have a relationship which is prone to these upswings and downswings, what is the role of governments? And I think this is a critical point because a lot depends on the choices which are exercised by uh, either government, given the kind of relationship which you are predisposed uh, to. Now, very clearly in a neighborhood situation, your, your relations have to be based on realism and on strategic realities. And therefore in India-Pakistan relations, security and military related strategic issues will always have a very major role. But exercising the right choices and looking at, when you're looking ahead also means that you see how can you desecuritize so heavily securitized a relationship. Now, this is not new. This is something which has been attempted for at least uh, 50, 60 years. How do you introduce non-security elements into a difficult relationship? And there are many ingredients uh, of desecuritization which have been attempted, some with greater success, some with lesser success. I think the challenge before India-Pakistan relations in the future uh, is that how do you uh, introduce non-security elements? How do you desecuritize while being mindful of all the strategic and security uh, related realities within which this relationship is going to be circum circumscribed. Now, this is a particularly apt moment to reflect on this uh, issue, given the scale of the pandemic and the, reali the realities it has forced us to uh, confront. And therefore, when we talk about national interest, I don't think it is possible realistically in India to talk about national interest without looking at social and economic factors much more uh, candidly than we have in the uh, in the past. How can you have national security without health security or without a greater spread of uh, greater improvement in your overall social indicators in terms of education, access to social infrastructure, etc. This morning we heard Suresh Prabhuji talking about climate change. Can you realistically expect to make a difference to climate change issues in India uh, without improving your overall education and literacy and health uh, profiles? Can you expect to fight a pandemic without people being sufficiently uh, and, uh, empowered with knowledge to realize uh, the, the, the problems which uh, 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 pandemics uh, the reasons why pandemics uh, come about. Can you deal with wash issues of water security without improving the overall social in infrastructure uh, in the country? And I think this, these questions, when we reflect about, uh, when we reflect upon them in India, really also are a kind of reflection on our relations with our neighbors in South Asia. And there, I think, desecuritization is really the critical uh, element when we look at our national security or indeed our national uh, interest. One final point, and I'll just mention it as a bullet point because my time is almost up, which is about SAR. I don't think we should overlook the narrative value which SARC has in South Asia. And while we can, at a technical level, in terms of meeting targets, improvise our way through sub-regional arrangements, I do think uh, it is India's responsibility and also India's role to think about uh, the narrative value of SAR uh, in South Asia uh, as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raghavan, uh, for, um, I think, rightfully concentrating on the most difficult people next door. I am borrowing from your, the title of your book. Uh, I think Pakistan needs to be concentrated upon by the Indian policymakers and is a key to stability, peace, and harmony in South Asia. May I now request Ambassador Puri, who is 
uh, not only been an eminent and, and, and a, a very able ambassador to Nepal, but he's also a commentator on United Nations these days, which I, we all uh, benefit uh, greatly, and w various other issues of India's foreign policy. Ambassador Puri, please. Professor Muni, uh, thank you very much. And at the outset, uh, please allow me to also join others in thanking Pramod Jaiswal and NICE. Uh, this Pramod is truly a wonderful effort. And I think what you have done would be a great template for others to follow if they could follow it. So kudos to you. Professor Muni, I like one thing very much, that you, a former ambassador of India, Arvind Gupta, Raghavan, and myself are plugged in one element of this presentation, and then the thinking guys will come after us. So no, no, I this thought, is you know, how, this is how they <laughs> listed you. I, I haven't done anything. <laughs> no. I haven't done anything. <laughs> this is how no, they have listed and wanted me to follow the list. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying anything about you. I'm talking about your former pupil, Prabodh Jaiswal and Prabodh, I like this. You know, we must have a little bit of all of this reparty too. Now, I want to thank Raghavan, who's my great friend, batchmate and so on for having introduced into the discourse an element of philosophy, an element of thinking, maybe political uh, international relations discourse also. These ideas of national interest, ideas of national security, ideas of national prestige. And if I focus on uh, the two countries to the north, uh, Nepal and slightly to Bhutan, they, these fit completely into that scenario. But Professor Muni, if you will allow me, I want to say something slightly contrarian here. First, I think all of us forget that South Asia, in sheer numbers and also in GDP, is going to be a very, very important part of the world. Within the next five years, India will possibly become the largest country in the world. We are currently the sixth largest economy, and I think we've taken a very big hit because of COVID. And so many of our aspirations may not get realized. But no matter these, we will certainly become the third largest economy in the world, whichever way we look at it, even in terms of the fact that COVID has hit us hard in terms of our economy. Now I want to say something which people in India usually are not very cognizant of, although of late, this has become quite fashionable which is the rise of two other countries in South Asia. One is, of course, Bangladesh, where everybody nowadays is talking about their economy, what they've done, and so on. And I think this is a tribute to their leadership, which has managed relationships externally very, very well. Remember, Bangladesh doesn't have the ability to do rent-seeking. It has no mineral endowment. It has almost very little except its human power. And they have harnessed that very well. We also forget the time when they had that fire, which almost wiped out the entire garment industry and how they bounced back. I would give a lot of credit to their leadership for having managed three relations extraordinarily well. India, China, and the West. I think we all in India tend to underestimate this. Secondly, even about Pakistan, for all the doldrums of their economy, let us understand that at 225 million people, it is already one of the largest societies in the world. And in the next 10 odd years, both Pakistan and Bangladesh will sit among the largest societies in the world, largest countries in population terms, and as one of the largest in GDP terms. And we in India should understand that our neighborhood first policy, therefore, has a huge set of elements of all of us. Let me also say something about Nepal. At 30 million, people in Nepal are very fond of saying small country. If Nepal was lo located in Europe, it would be the fifth largest country in that continent. Nobody would say it's a small country. But yes, as compared to India, China, as compared even to Bangladesh, Pakistan, it is a small country. Although in geography, etc., it's pretty big. But I want to say something to you about India, Nepal in economic terms. You know, if you leave India's exports to the United States and the United Arab Emirates and China, including Hong Kong out, which are all in the region of 35 to $25 billion a year, the next 10 set of countries are in the region of 7 to $8 billion. 
now a lot of reportage in india of late has been that bangladesh has become our largest export destination it's about 8 billion nepal which remains four or five places below that is at 7 billion and professor muni someone like you and many others who are listening to this we have an open border believe me india's legitimate trade i'm not talking about you know smuggling etc because there's an open border things are allowed to be carried the sale of indian products in nepal certainly exceeds bangladesh and in my opinion nepal would always rank among five largest export destinations of india that i think is something if we internalize in india it would make many many things better the next point i want to make is a very big point which again in india we tend to undersee especially in the context of a country like nepal where we look at hdi figures which are poor poverty figures which are poor etc but we forget and do not understand that since 1990 when nepal started issuing passports nepal today is a very changed country it's not just that it isn't a hindu kingdom there's no king and it has declared itself a secular country i don't want to get into the current politics of nepal it isn't just that it is the fact that it has come to face with globalization more than 25% of nepal's population is overseas and india is not the only place where they are going they are there today in the americas in large number in europe in huge numbers in southeast asia in very large numbers and of course in the gulf indeed if i recall qatar has a quota system and at some stage had decided that nepalese and indians would be roughly around the same number and i think that continues to hold true in fact uh, i mean on a lighter note i might say that many people from both countries managed to obtain passports of the others to get over this quota business but you know those are facts and realities of life i think we in india need to understand that a country like nepal and now i will say a country like bhutan bhutan as a result of the huge amount of wealth india may be responsible because of buying hydropower but the huge changes which are under, uh, undergoing these society are going to be issues of challenge to india and why do i say that i say that because the aspirational requirements of societies even in a poorer country like nepal are such that only india cannot meet just as we are unable to meet our own middle classes aspiration trade with china is not huge only because we import a large number of intermediary goods it's also because every single thing that you and i perhaps consume and have elevated our lifestyle is because china has been there to be able to supply them earlier it was japan and then south korea but now it's china and that is the same change that you see in nepal you see and you might even start seeing it in bhutan although it's a smaller country and far richer in fact many people don't understand that bhutan perhaps is the country where the government finances students from its country to go abroad for higher studies perhaps in the largest measure possible anywhere in the world and it's not just to india it's across the world today and they have the abilities to be able to. so this change globalization uh, professor muni i notice i have a few minutes so i'll stop very shortly globalization is something we should understand we also need to understand as part of globalization the entire question of urbanization which is going on i want to stop here i'll just leave one thought in the midst of all this for all the facts that india should realize the changing scenario all around these countries should also realize that at the end of the day no matter what happens india will become the third largest economy in the world india will grow and go places and so therefore they all have an automatic plus in being able to deal with india its society its economy and if they start getting the politics of that right the benefits will accrue to them perhaps more than they would accrue to us we in fact have to become more used to the idea that an fta with one of these countries may not necessarily result in that balance or that favorable balance that we are looking for but the fta the larger fta that i am talking about the fta of connectivity which uh, mr arvind gupta ambassador gupta mentioned these particular things would be certainly of their advantage not just of our advantage and it would make south asia itself far bigger player and a greater uh, let me say stakeholder in the world i want to uh, say something about climate change etc this is a global problem 
we can all contribute locally, but the issues are global. So if something doesn't happen in the Americas, it's going to affect you. Uh, it is a issue of that kind. And I think on that, several of the countries do tend to have slightly different perspectives. Uh, Pakistan and India, for example, invariably share the same set of perspectives. Bangladesh, for a variety of its maritime reasons, has to have a different thing. And so does Nepal. But the fact of cooperation would do us all a lot of good. And I think everybody can benefit from India's growth and India from there doing well. Thank you very much, Professor Mohan. Thank you, Ambassador. Sorry for pressing you on time, but you have made a, you brought out a very interesting point that is about the neighborhood perspective on India, which is very critical aspect of it, success of India's neighborhood uh, first policy. And here I see there is a conflict between the identity issues and the interest issues. And they have not been able to resolve this conflict in the sense I am fond of saying that they do not, they have not come out with a consensus amongst themselves and within themselves both as to how close is not too close to India. And it is too close which heavily weighs on them and they keep their horses pulled back. So this is where their problem is. Thank you very much. May I now request uh, Dr. Uttam Sinha to share his comments, a very well-known expert on South Asian and I would say global water resources. He has turned out an excellent book on Indus uh, water issues between India and Pakistan. Dr. Sina, please. Unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor Muni. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. I think uh, it's an important theme to discuss uh, what is India's neighborhood first, or what you say, uh, the neighborhood 2.0. Uh, to begin with, let me say that it is a very powerful uh, conceptualization because it fundamentally uh, breaks away from the politics and the security first approach uh, and desires a more integrated, human-centered, and I would even say welfare-oriented welfare actions, you know. And I think integral to India's neighborhood first is also the Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas thinking, uh, which makes it even more dynamic and interesting. And I, think, and I think to view this region in terms of functions, which the neighborhood first defines, I think is, it's, it's a landmark way of looking at, at the neighborhood because we've often looked at South Asia as, as competing political units. Now we have a certain vision which shifts us away, at least in terms of thinking and also in terms of action, to a more uh, working peace systems, away from a more protected peace uh, that people talked about uh, in the World War Day's time. And I think this is something very, uh, very striking. Um, the chair um, mentioned about uh, the first neighborhood approach as being very integral to India's foreign policy. Uh, but the question still remains whether it is integral to the rest of the countries in in South Asia. And I think this is something that we need to observe uh, carefully um, because we need not be completely carried away uh, by this conceptualization. And we have to think in terms of a more realistic on, on the ground approaches, I think. I think it's important really in the 21st century with the new kind of challenges we see to emphasize more on people to people connectivity, you know, on livelihood issues, uh, new transport links and corridors, improvement of border infrastructures, uh, data sharing, I think will be an important part of this neighborhood first approach, especially on, on the rivers, especially on the melting of the glaciers, etc. So I think conceptually, it is strong, uh, and it needs to be really carried through the murky politics and the mistrust uh, that exists. My second point is to say that you know, while politics, security, misperceptions will remain embedded in the region, uh, there are several non-zero sum challenges that can integrate states and their actions and bring in some effective policies. I mean, Ambassador Raghavan talked about, you know, desecuritization. I would rather say there is a need to search for security optimality, you know, optimality. Uh, and that balances both what are traditional and non-traditional security challenges, you know, without really 
undercutting some of the real existential issues that exist uh, in South Asia, issues like climate change or, or the food and energy water nexus that is strongly emerging as, as an important challenge or you know, the infrastructure development that are required. Uh, so these are something that we need to really uh, look into and, and concentrate without undermining national security. There's enough space really to work on these existential uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and therefore, my third point would be, we need to create space for institutionalization, you know, new mechanisms uh, to achieve some of the principal goals and ends uh, of the region, which are, I think, very, very human centered. Uh, often we talk about, you know, lofty corporations and treaties. I mean, these require political convergences that can be very difficult to achieve. And therefore, the focus then should be more on institutions, stakeholder participation, cross-border economic and commercial zones, et cetera. I think these will become uh, uh, very relevant. <clears throat> Creation of technical and scientific agencies can also further bolster uh, the neighborhood first approach. And if you go back in time and a bit of history, you'll see how the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, evolved. It was, it was a strikingly new institution that, that provided public service, you know, and it sort of broke down the territorial basis of, of state authority. I think these kind of uh, examples and a bit of history into seeing how it can be part of a public service uh, uh, is quite important in, in the South Asia case, okay, especially if you look at the rivers in South Asia. Can we uh, move uh, into a certain time that when we can create a specific agency to develop and execute uh, ambitious plans on dam constructions or hydraulic engineering or electricity generation, they can also create further jobs, you know, in this area, regulate flood uh, damage, etc. So, are we enlightened enough in this region, uh, beyond the politics of things, to think about new agencies, uh, new institutions, and, and new mechanisms? I think that that will really take the neighborhood first approach uh, forward in a significant uh, uh, way. <clears throat> uh, I think we have to start thinking in terms of building blocks. Each block will help us ease uh, political tensions. Uh, a good example, I think, in the region is the border hearts between India and Bangladesh. Uh, they are providing significant uh, uh, socio socioeconomic gains. And I think these, uh, the successes of these hearts are also influencing uh, some of the ways to explore initiatives on the, on the India-Myanmar border. Uh, Bhutan has considerably, a landlocked country has ex uh, you know, considerably gained from the integrated uh, intermodal transport linkages between India and Bangladesh. So I think these are small building blocks that can really help uh, ease political tensions uh, in South Asia. I think that is something that we have to also understand in the neighborhood uh, first concept. My fourth point and very quickly is that uh, uh, the one thing we miss about India and its bigness is that it can also be a great transit country. You know, uh, See the rivers, the linkages, et cetera. I think that needs to be exploited in the neighborhood first, far more than it has been now. Uh, prospects for developing India's landscape of transport and logistics infrastructures and services are something that can really bolster uh, uh, the neighborhood first approach. Cross boundary rivers can play a great role. Uh, uh, as a transit nation, we need to refashion the way we look at rivers now, away from the volumetric uh, sharing of the volume of the water to a more uh, benefit sharing arrangements in the future. Looking more at sub-basin actions uh, can also, in some sense, add to the whole neighborhood first approach. Uh, my fifth point is to say that the region increasingly will face more and more existential challenges. Um, climate change, the impact on the glaciers in particular. And, and given this vulnerability of climate change uh, in the region, the states all the states, whether they are the Himalayan states or the coastline states or the island states, they're all in some sense frontline states in coping with climate change. Uh, and, and we have to really relook at this whole idea of the region, a region which is very vulnerable uh, to climate change impact. And, and whether we can have mechanisms that can create more nature-based systems or climate resilient governance structures in the region is something that can add greater value uh, to the neighborhood first approach. So in conclusion, I would say that, uh, you know, that regionalism is, I think, the new mantra, the new realism 
and, and it's a reality that we really can't escape. And without being very over optimistic about it, I would say that it will, um, it will require a great deal of realistic approach, more technocratic efforts and flexible spaces to see that the neighborhood first uh, approach or the principle moves along. And I think after all, you know, in South Asia, uh, we have to look at South Asia as our living space as our existential space, as our livelihood space. And if this reconceptualization happens, it will add great attraction to the neighborhood first approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sina, for identifying several mechanisms and areas for this South Block Mandarins to explore and uh, see if they can revamp the neighborhood first policy by using some of them. May I now request uh, Smriti Patnaik, a very senior scholar at IDSA and a very uh, prolific commentator on most of the South Asian issues. Smriti, please. Uh, thank you, sir, and good morning to everyone. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Pramod for uh, providing you know, this platform where I can uh, share my thought. Uh, some of the views has already been expressed by previous my uh, fellow panelists uh, who have spoken on this issue. The, of course, I've chosen, uh, you know, the ethnocultural linkages in the neighborhood first policy. Uh, however, I would like to submit first that the neighborhood first policy is not uh, in that sense, uh, perhaps new, though, of course, uh, Professor Muni has spoken about the neighborhood first uh, 2.0, but neighborhood has always been at the core of India's foreign policy. Though, of course, the conceptualization of neighborhood has seen a uh, change. You know, at one point of time, Iran and uh, Myanmar was considered as neighbor. Here, I'm just uh, taking the, you know, the basically the definition of neighborhood within the SARC parameter. And of course, we have left out uh, Myanmar and uh, uh, Iran in the conceptualization of the neighborhood first uh, policy. Uh, yeah. So therefore, I would like to say that uh, if one looks at what has changed in the neighborhood uh, first policy, Uttam also mentioned some of the points, uh, perhaps we have shifted from a security centricism uh, in our neighborhood policy to a much more economic interaction. Now, what does this particular uh, change do? Uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, this particular policy, the security centricism actually ends India's interaction with the border. So border is mostly seen as a kind of, you know, where the security measures come up. So therefore, uh, you know, the, the conceptualization of the <coughs> uh, tend to look at other numbers through the security prism. Now, when you look at the economic prism of India's interaction, here also the cultural prism comes into, uh, into playing a kind of role, uh, the border is no more a limiting factor. In fact, the border opens up India to several opportunities which lies across the border. Uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Raghavan also spoke about it, even Uttam also mentioned about it, you know, uh, the riverine uh, structure of transportation, which used to be there in the pre-partisan days, is now being uh, revi revitalized in this uh, particular perspective. So therefore, I'm starting border is no more the securitization point, rather it is it has become an econ economic opportunity. Uh, the, of course, uh, you know, the borders of India provides a very different perspective on, of India's neighborhood first policy. India shares open border with Nepal and Bhutan, where you know you don't need visa. So therefore, the interaction between the people of India and Nepal and people of India and Bhutan is no more uh, controlled by the state as one sees in the context of other countries because you require visa. So in, to, to a very large extent, the state determines who can come in and who can uh, you know who cannot uh, come in. So therefore, with these two countries, we do not have the state structure deciding the people-to-people -people contact or the, or the cultural interaction. But if you look at the other borders of India, which is, you know, the Bangladesh and Myanmar, even though securitized, I will consider them as porous border because many things happens because of the porous border. You may have the security forces there, but then the interaction 
also is prompted by the porousness of the border and also by the ethnocultural linkages which is there across the border. But of course, with Pakistan, we have a much more securitized border where you have the permission of suited uh, site. So therefore, uh, we need to look at uh, this. Of course, you know, we had uh, the Red Cliff line uh, drawing where, you know, the maps were decided on the basis of revenue maps in the eastern part of border. So therefore, when you visit to the border in the, on the eastern part, especially to Tripura, you see a border pillar lying in the middle of a house. So when you ask the people who are living in that particular house and you know ask them the citizenship, they just give you a smile because for them, the citizenship is immaterial because that uh, cross-border contact is much more historical and very, very uh, ancient. Uh, so, so taking all this into consideration, I would like to say that there has been both marriage relationship across the border there is familial relationship across the border and of course the cultural sites which lies across the border and uh, pilgrimage to some of these cultural sites you know which we, because pilgrimage is a significant part of any you know all of our existence so therefore uh, without traveling to each other countries you cannot really complete your journey uh, in one's life uh, so therefore though of course when one look at both india and pakistan one has seen uh, the marital relationship has completely reduced, you know, by 1965, almost it came to an end. However, you have this kind of multi-layered familial relationship, which is, uh, you know, which you can, one can see across the border. So uh, what has the drawing of the boundary and the creation of nation state, in fact, has divided ethnic groups who have straddled across the border. For example, in Manipur and Myanmar, one has ethnic groups traveling across the border and are bound with familial uh, ties. Therefore, it is not surprising some of the times you see the chief minister of both Manipur and Mizoram, uh, you know, have been a part of ethnic negotiation or has been part of ethnic conflict where they have played a role of negotiator to bring in peace even among the ethnic groups within uh, Myanmar. And that also uh, tells you that why in the recent past, the Mizoram chief minister very clearly said that it becomes very difficult to stop for people who are coming, who are crossing the border from Myanmar to Mizoram to take asylum because of these particular ethnic ties, you know, to escape the military regime, uh, regime there. Uh, so therefore, I would say that, uh, in fact, these familial and uh, determined the 16 kilometers where you know the people can travel across the border in Manipur and, and Myanmar. One also notices a similar approach when Tripura hosted Chakmas during the incidency in, in the CHT and in fact India uh, was very keen that this particular uh, you know CHT agreement uh, needed to be signed so that the Chakmas can go back. So the ethnocultural linkages actually willy-nilly ties India to the domestic conflict in the neighborhood, uh, where it really cannot, uh, you know, close its eyes because uh, of these cross-border uh, familial ties which actually exist. And that is one of the reasons why perhaps, uh, you know, India was party to the 12-point uh, agreement where uh, we have mostly looked towards a kind of... Uh, uh, stability and uh, in this particular stability I have always uh, uh, felt that democracy is not a very important criteria rather than the stability has been a very significant criteria in India's neighborhood policy. Now what does the stability does? The stability in fact prods India to see a kind of accommodation of the minority ethnic groups staying in the neighborhood but who also have familiar and uh, you know ethnic ties with people across the border for a kind of political accommodation in or uh, you know in the setup in the neighboring countries whether it is about the madesis in uh, nepal or whether it is about the tamils in sri lanka uh, you know india has looked towards a kind of ethnic accommodation though of course you know the aspiration of these particular groups may be you know much larger compared to what uh, they have uh, got uh, as far as India is concerned. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, because you know the shortage of uh, time, uh, if one looks at the ethnocultural uh, ethno linkages, 
I think uh, it has broken the status barrier of defining what a nation is. And, you know, because we have a majoritarian conception of nation states in South Asia, as Professor Muni was mentioning, and the interest and the identity is sometime, you know, is conflicting. How close would not be considered as a globe, as, as close. So therefore, this majoritarian construct of the nation states in the neighborhood also has seen increasingly, you know, in the neighborhood 2.0, I would say that how the ethnic communities are, uh, you know, addressed by India, keeping India's own domestic, um, you know, domestic politics in mind. So whether it is India's support uh, to the Madesias, uh, you know, the agitation in 2015, which had the Bihar election in mind, or whether it is meeting uh, the Motua community in Bangladesh, also had the West Bengal election is ma in, in mind. So therefore, you see these interlinkages are also playing into, uh, you know, the, uh, the factor of, uh, you know, India's domestic politics. So therefore, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, the ethnocultural affiliation, in spite of majoritarian impulse, has been exhibited by the, all the South Asian states. The economic interaction between the people living near the border who shared century old relationship has been replicated in the border markets in Manipur and several border hearts that has now been opened up between India and Bangladesh. And it also allows, you know, the trade, uh, you know, with local goods, which takes into the reality of the economic relationship that existed prior to partition. And this is the same thing which you see, which is being replicated. Uh, in the cross-border, uh, you know, interaction between the Kashmiris, uh, both trade and people-to-people -people contact. So therefore, I would like to conclude by saying that the border states uh, bordering India's border are likely, likely to have a very significant role. Uh, they are playing a role, of course, it is limited by what the central government wants our relationship to, to be. But if uh, ethnocultural relationship has to be prioritized, or people-to-people -people contact has to be prioritized. I would like to end by saying that the border states have to play a very significant role in India's neighborhood policy. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, sir. thank you, thank you, Smriti, for bringing out two points very, very clearly. Uh, one is the cultural and civilizational proximity between the people of the countries in the subcontinent or South Asia. And secondly, by uh, flagging the role of the bordering states and what they can do. I'm also glad that you mentioned and brought in uh, Myanmar uh, in your discussion. Last but not the least, we have Professor Sanjay Bharadwaj uh, from the School of International Studies. Uh, he has uh, worked very closely on Bangladesh and recently he has brought out an excellent book on the energy security for the whole of Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, Professor Bhardwaj, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let me first uh, express my thanks to uh, Dr. Pramo Jaiswal for making uh, part of this uh, learned panel and that is chaired by Professor Muni. And also uh, thank you, uh, NICE, for giving this opportunity. Uh, you know, it is, uh, Professor, it's very difficult to speak uh, as last speaker while all the points, all the major areas has been... I said last but not the least. <laughs> sir, sir. So uh, I'm going to speak, like I'm going to discuss India's neighborhood policy into two uh, broader perspectives because India's neighborhood policy is framed and work into two uh, broader perspective. One is the regional international uh, system. And of course, the other is the nature of leadership. And you know, while the uh, neighborhood also makes India policy, these factors also work while there are change of guards uh, in neighbor, neighboring countries, the policy and perspective and the relations are, are, are different while uh, uh, the other, gu other guards into, uh, into uh, are ruling in, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, Dr. Smriti has uh, clearly po clearly point out that uh, you know you can't understand uh, neighborhood policy without going and having a retrospective approach. And uh, there she tried to uh, define the uh, region. In fact, I do find that uh, Nehru has defined region in a broader perspective from Persian world to uh, Indo Indo Pacific region, and that he did not fix himself. Uh, with the American constructs, what the South Asia is. He was talking, looking neighbors in more of Asian Brotherhood 
uh, context. The shift has been taken place while Indira Gandhi came uh, into power and she has looked, uh, uh, looked neighborhood in the sense of uh, reciprocity or, or like India security has been linked with the neighborhood uh, security. But you, you will see that there's a major shift in India's uh, policy towards the neighboring countries while we are talking about India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, 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 Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, all the neighboring countries. We do find this major shift from uh, reciprocity to non-reciprocity while Gujarat came into uh, power and Gujarat has introduced uh, this policy. And this uh, non-reciprocity policy had, had tried to resolve many contentious issues between India and its neighboring countries while keeping neighbors into uh, good, good faith. And there are, there are the examples of Ganges Water Treaty, you can see CST Accord, Mahakali Treaty. And then Vajpayee came into power and he talked about, uh, as you said, that bus diplomacy. And he wanted to look uh, the entire neighbor into, uh, into a regional framework or neighborhood framework. But while Manmohan Singh came into power, that I do find that what, uh, what Gujaral has shifted the policy from reciprocity to non-reciprocity, uh, Manmohan Singh has taken more generous, uh, or you can say give, started giving leverage to the neighboring countries in its development and shaped and framed the policy from bilateralism to uh, multilateralism. And this multilateral approach of, uh, of Manmohan Singh had basically uh, given a very good framework of cooperation uh, between uh, between uh, the India and its neighbor. Particularly, I can point it out one uh, one uh, agreement that framework agreement cooperation with Bangladesh while Sheikh Hasina visited to India uh, in 2010 uh, in 2010 and then 2010 they have signed an agreement and in that agreement it was decided that we will have a regional framework of, uh, we will have bilateral cooperation in regional framework and that, in that regional framework what the multilateralism has come out that uh, you know uh, the this uh, like uh, dealing with the water or contentious issues that the two countries has understood that we will take a basin wise approach to address the problem of water sharing and in this basin wise approach we will also see what are the other emerging areas what are the climate and environmental issues uh, that how we can cooperate how we can develop a better uh, peaceful uh, peaceful neighborhood of course uh, manmohan singh has also tried to give leverage of its economic in the sense of uh, in the in the context of science and technology in the healthcare sector he tried to have uh, visa liberalizations, uh, uh, that kind of, so, so that, that more people to people co contact can be uh, done, more cooperations in the areas of science and technology uh, can be uh, established. What one more very important thing uh, from Manmohan Singh government has come out that whatever the India had been adopting a unilateral approach dealing with the neighboring countries, uh, issues or bilateral issues, that the unilateralism has been transformed and shifted from uh, constructive unilateralism. And this constructive unilateralism has been, uh, has, has been linked with the regional uh, developmental approach. And this, in, this constructive un, unilateralism had started extending line of credit to the neighboring countries. You know, uh, uh, first agreement was with, between India and Bangladesh that $1 billion uh, line of credit has been, uh, has, has been given to Bangladesh. And the same manner, we have extended line of credit to uh, Afghanistan, uh, to, uh, to Sri Lanka, and there we have come out with many projects of uh, this, uh, in, in this uh, unilateral approach. In fact, it, he has come out, come out from market-oriented uh, approach to developmental-oriented approach that we can have infrastructures, we can have more connectivity, connectivity within the region, and we can, have, have, we can link uh, this, uh, the, the entire uh, entire uh, regions by uh, by uh, okay. a more uh, developmental project uh, oriented approach. What in fact had come out uh, come out, come out well, more, uh, from Modi, in fact, you can say that he has basically he had been more firm to execute the policies what had been adopted by Gujral and by Vajpayee and by Manmohan Singh. And in fact, he had come out whatever the resource nationalism policy was there. Now we will come out, we will we'll have a resource sharing policies. And in the resource sharing policies, let the Bangladesh also, uh, Bangladesh can, can have access, in, uh, access and invest in Nepal's hydroelectricity projects, in Bhutan's hydroelectricity projects that uh, where that Bangladesh is willing to do so, wanted to import uh, energy from, uh, from, from Nepal and from, uh, from uh, Bhutan. Also, that led Bhutan has also 
have access to Mongla and Chittagong port uh, so that, and one, one you can say it's a BBIN approach also had come out. My point is there that there are there are number of uh, possibilities, number of areas where these countries, particularly the Eastern South Asian countries, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and India, wants to have and cooperate uh, with each other. Particularly, Sheikh Hasina in 2020 has said that we want to, we wanted to be part of the India's activist policy or whatever the projects that India has in the Eastern uh, or East or Southeast Asian countries. We will, we want to be part of. Particularly, that India, uh, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand uh, uh, road road connectivity projects uh, kinds of. So my point is there, my submission is there that if that what Modi government the, or neighborhood in the neighborhood first policy, he has linked uh, all the South, uh, South Asian countries with its uh, broader poly uh, or with, the, with this extended neighborhood, or you can say uh, with, it, with, it, with its uh, act least policy uh, in, in broader perspectives. Thank you very much, sir, for giving this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bharadwaj. Now we have, I think, an excellent menu of the policy and practical issues is scrutinized with academic flavor. And that is what goes back to MS Rapuri's comments earlier that mixing of uh, diplomats with the academics is of uh, quite greatly useful. But we have uh, diplomats like uh, Dr. Raghavan who actually mix academic and uh, policy scrutiny between them within himself also. So, you know, besides the panel, you have very rich, rich discussion. Now, Pramod, tell us how much time we are left with. So half an hour, 30 minutes. Okay, that's not bad. So uh, we have a lot of questions. I'll read out those questions and then leave it to the uh, panelists to pick up and comment on them so that you can prioritize. But uh, each one of you may not have more than two to three minutes to comment, I'm sorry to say, but that's what it is. Now, before I start reading out the questions from the audiences, I have two questions in my mind, which I should flag. Anybody can reflect on that. Number one, what is the role which has been played in India's for neighborhood first policy between ideology and strategic interests? What have we preferred? To what extent one has moderated the other? And secondly, to what extent the Chinese challenge has brought about some basic shifts in India's neighborhood policy. For instance, uh, in the beginning, uh, I'm talking of the long period which we have before us, we were very hesitant to have any third country play a role in our neighborhood uh, uh, besides us. We wanted to play the major role. India wanted to play the major role. Now we are reasonably comfortable uh, playing this role with countries like the US and Japan and third countries, uh, largely because um, uh, on, on our own, we find it is uh, difficult to uh, cope with the Chinese uh, expansion and Chinese uh, influence growing around. Now, let me very quickly read out the um, um, uh, questions which have come from the uh, uh, commentators. And uh, that will, uh, just a minute. Yeah, from here. Uh, first question is for Dr. Arvind Gupta. Sir, while India often blames its small neighbors for the lack of stability in its neighborhood, for example, but most of the time, the reason for instability has been India itself. This is number one. Uh, Second, uh, brilliant and thoughtful analysis by Dr. Raghavan Sahab, so compliment. Despite our neighborhood first policy, third question uh, by Mr. Subhash Shukla, why have we not been able to counter the growing cooperation between China and our smaller neighbors? Then again by Trisha Chatterjee, to everyone, with China's booming economy, even during the pandemic, how much do you think would it significantly impact India's neighborhood policy. Then there is a question for Dr. Muni, which I will leave. I am not the panelist. Uh, then a question for uh, Dr. Raghavan. Sir, when you say that India and Pakistan has resolved differences, do we also include the civilizational clash between the two? And other than the historical 
political and security reasons. What is the civilizational clash between India and Pakistan? Anyway, uh, then a uh, question for Ambassador Puri. Uh, the last one year suggests a new global, uh, the last one year suggests a new global order, which may not be possibly led by the United States and the Western Hemisphere. How and is it possible for India to step up their foreign policy to possibly lead this new global order? Then again, question for Ambassador Puri, in this era of globalization and migration, what do we have to say for the large number of Nepalese and Indian migrant populations getting exploited in various other countries? Again, for Ambassador Puri. Sorry. Nepalese, uh, sorry, this is not, uh, I'm sorry. Again, for in this era, sorry, this has been done already. Nepalese citizens are still recruited to Indian Army and many central government services. Nepalese citizens are also recruited to the British Army. There are often people to people. How does this affect Indo-Nepal relations? Um, again, uh, for Dr. Gupta, do you see any possibility of Nepal being a bridge between India and China land link linked and in near future as the great power game is on in the region? Uh, then uh, I am uh, Manoj Chaudhary, political science, all right. While, uh, while security issues seem to be giving away the other issues, economic, cultural in the relationship, between neighboring countries. This may be true at a people to people level. However, nation states cannot afford to forget the security of their borders. Uh, since India closed ties with the US, how it would affect India's foreign policy towards the neighboring countries? Question to Dr. Uttam Sena and all the concerned, the strategic value of water as most essential resource is rising with the rise in population in South Asia. What common strategies to be adopted to enhance water security in the region? Uh, then uh, mutual cooperation uh, should how best it can be pursued. Drug and gold smuggling is growing on in Manipur. Uh, does corruption play a role in border policy? Well, these are the questions I have just read it out. Uh, please choose your uh, uh, theme and go ahead with it. And uh, now uh, for, for the sake of uh, uh, what you call uh, equality, can I start from the rivers uh, with uh, Dr. Gupta's permission, if you say so. All yes, right, let course. me start yes. from the ri yes, rivers. Sanjay, very quickly, you want to say anything on these questions? Yes, please. But unmute yourself, Sanjay. Unmute yourself. Organizers may unmute Dr. Sanjay, uh, Sanjay Bhardwaj, please. Okay, so we are doing it. It's taking a few minutes. Sir, please unmute yourself. Sanjay, sir, you are. I think he's not around. He's not around. Let me go to Smriti Patnaik now. Uh, sir, uh, on the you know on the question which was uh, spoken about the security of the border, whether it can be undermined because of the cultural and economic relationship, I think cultural and economic relationship uh, you know actually constitute a very different kind of interaction. And uh, it actually does not mean necessarily that the security of the borders are undermined because of the people-to-people -people contact. What I was making a difference, uh, whereas people-to-people -people contact is controlled by the states in many of the countries in South Asia, the, you know, in, in the context of Nepal and Bhutan, the people-to-people -people contact is not controlled by the state because of the open border, because you are not approaching any state agency for, a, for visa. Uh, on the question, sir, which you have posed very broadly, and I will just speak very, very quickly about this interplay of the ideology and strategic interests. My understanding is that strategic interests still 
you know, is uh, significant. I think it has probably uh, overcome. Of course, you know, when you one speaks of ideology, one has to look at, at particular countries uh, where the ideology may be an important aspect of India's neighborhood policy, but not uh, as far as other countries are concerned. So therefore, I would say that uh, strategic interests are significant. In fact, because of these strategic interests, the unnecessary securitization in border trade also uh, hampers the economic interaction. Like, for example, uh, you need several documents, you know, to do trade across no, the border because don't, of don't go, don't go in details. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in, the, in the context, yeah, I do agree that uh, unlike, uh, you know, the parameter of bilateralism and India's dominance in the neighborhood, uh, India is now very much open to third party uh, presence and third party intervention in terms of whether it was Sri Lanka's peace process, whether, whether it was Anmin uh, in Nepal or whether it is in Bangladesh where the US played a significant role along with India. Thank you, Do sir. Dr. Sina, please. Um, just on the question of the China factor, if you look at, uh, you know, I would like to make uh, a point here that hydrologically, uh, China is now very much part of South Asia uh, through the control of the rivers in Tibet. And as the rivers flow into South Asia, it has a hydrological stake in it. And therefore, in some sense or the other... That, that, that will strengthen the argument of some of the South Asian countries no, Can but China be made a part of SARC? Not a part of SARC, but hydrologically, we have to understand where China is located. Politically, you might keep China away from the larger participation in the politics of South Asia. But hydrologically, given the dependency of the rivers from the glaciers in, in Tibet, uh, China is very much part, hydrologically part of, of the South Asia riverine concept. Now, it is also an upper riparian and a dominant upper IP, where it controls the rivers. So I think South Asian states in particular, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, can think more in terms of low riparian cooperation amongst them. You know, there is already a forum called the, the Delta Formation. You know, all the Delta countries around the world have gathered together. And this will also bring you closer more to the Mekong uh, river basins, where you have a set of Southeast Asian countries uh, dependent on the upriparian and China. So this lower riparian cooperation, if not a coalition, uh, can be an interesting dynamic that can bring in the challenges that down riparian states face uh, in South Asia. On the question of um, the larger water issues in, in, in South Asia, I think quite clearly we have long-standing treaties, uh, especially with Pakistan and, and with Bangladesh. Um, the Indus Waters has a completely different format of the treaty. But if you look at the Ganga Treaty with Bangladesh, uh, 1925, it sort of ends. So we'll have to relook uh, at, at some of these treaties again. So when we relook at the rivers, we have to have a different set of approaches now. Beyond the volumes and the sharing principles, we have to look at what the benefits can be derived here. And I think the strong point of, of the transboundary rivers in in, 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 in South Asia is that it helps us to reimagine um, the region in terms of geography. You know, the riverine neighborhood is a very powerful concept which can link states here in terms of what are the benefits we can derive. And one of the principal benefits, I think, is, uh, is navigation on these rivers. It will help trade, it will help movement. And I think it's one of the important elements that has given us a lot of traction in India and Nepal. Uh, relationship. So it's moving beyond just uh, producing electricity to looking at other shared benefits that can come about. Well, these, uh, these are very valid uh, suggestions, uh, Uttam. The problem is that despite these valid suggestions, why for years we have not been able to translate them into policy issues and concrete. And this is where I think you were using uh, Prime Minister Modi's phrase of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, but you forgot to mention Sabka Vishwas. So I think the real problem is of, um, uh, you know, uh, trust deficit. And this is where I say a lot of other issues creep up of uh, identity, of strategic interest, of third country interventions and whatever else it is. That despite the utility of these 
very useful uh, aspects which you have flagged the policy makers uh, are hesitant in implementing them or turning them into concrete policy uh, packages uh, if you have uh, to contradict me you are welcome uh, but i thought i'll just make a comment on this on, any on other it, no, just only to say that before i said sabka saath sabka vikas i had already said mistrust and trust deficit i know but bo <laughs> this is modi's phrase which is vishwas includes that's why i reminded you ambassador puri please Uh, thank you, Professor Muni. Let me just take uh, this one question about the global order and and third countries' presence. You know, I may be old-fashioned, but in respect of Nepal, I certainly believe that for India, ekla chalore, and I'll say so why. Let me give you a simple example. You know, the greater the involvement of Westernization, the greater the entree for China. just think a little bit about what i am saying the aspirations that get developed we are not in a position to answer them as yet neither even in india and they get answered by the greatest uh, set of people on the global trading community route which is the chinese the great suppliers to the world that's not really changing so very quickly we may have hypernationalism we may have many of these things neither has covid made much of a great difference and i don't think that the post covid order this covid is an issue in fact it is my considered belief that china slipped up on this covid business 6 7 10 years later their economy may have been the largest economy in the world and many things would have been very different today for all this to say that the global order won't be led by the united states i don't know a coming together of the western alliance makes it a huge dominant affair will they come together will they come together how well will they come together i don't know the answers to that but i do believe that if they come together for the chinese too there might be a certain salutary good reasoning to continue to you know sort of swim in that so called rules based order and then look at it at a particular point of time remember much of technological advantage is getting smoothened out the 500 years advantage of technology is getting smoothened out through demography india has a role but i don't think we are anywhere near being truly major players in this game my own answer to all this is we must strongly look at india rather than india and this alliance this and push for the world to see india for what it's worth either a large economy or a large purveyor of technology very often in our diplomatic and in our foreign policy we tend to forget that and that does not come to the very fore you know i leave this thought with you that for much of the west and others the interest in india in our market is obvious we know it but we must promote that much more because it is india which i see as a big possibility and i leave one thought right at the end of this webinar remember if we do become the third largest economy in the world then 1 plus 3 or 2 plus 3 versus 1 i don't know the answers but there could be a competition of where you are with the one country that you think that you are a natural ally with because in various ways the freedoms the democracy etc that we say why them why not us as the leaders of the world thank you very much well ambassador puri while you were still in kathmandu india had started collaborating with japan and and the us in nepal itself in no sir we were Kansas. doing very little you know we were not doing anything neither with these two countries it was ekla chalo re and i don't want to get into what i was doing and i was not doing but these collaborations with the united states etc very old collaboration the point that i made to you is that every single one of those collaboration results in a greater entree for the country that we want to take keep at bay i think that's something that ordinary people would understand also all right we must take your word as the authentic one uh, dr you. raghavan please let me touch on two points firstly uh, the china factor in south asia and secondly the question which was put that why did i say that differences between india and pakistan uh, cannot be resolved uh, well quite simply because 
of differences over Jammu and Kashmir. For Indians, Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India. For Pakistan, for Pakistanis, K in Pakistan stands for Kashmir. The, their, their stated positions, their constitutional and legal positions uh, make it uh, not possible to realistic, re realistically envisage a situation where these two totally opposed ideas can be brought together. Does this mean that, this is what I mean by that these are not resolvable, but does this mean that uh, India-Pakistan relations as a whole cannot move ahead? No, it does not. I think what has been attempted in the past 50, 60 years, and as I said, with varying degrees of success, is how do you sidestep this, the fact that you have differing constitutional uh, positions and these constitutional positions are related to your uh, national identities uh, and, uh, and how you see yourself as a nation uh, state. So you have attempted various ways of sidestepping this issue and really that is the way forward and that is the challenge for diplomacy. This does mean that there will remain an intrinsic fragility to India-Pakistan relations. But as I also said, such, this is not, you know, peculiar to India and Pakistan. Many neighboring country relationships around the world, fragility, but the challenge for their diplomacy is how do you, how do you consolidate the relationship knowing about this uh, fragility? So this is what I was trying to say. On the China factor, uh, let me say that I think uh, in the past 25 years, the Chinese have constructed a new narrative of modernity, and it has had a very profound impact on all of South Asia. Whether we like it or not, that is, I think, uh, the fact. What do we do about it? I think one thing is what we should not do. I think in the past, our approach to a great extent was that the constitution of India is a template for our neighbors. So how you deal with federal issues or how you deal with uh, uh, ethnic or linguistic issues. We thought the Indian constitution has the solution and we would photocopy the relevant pages and give it to many of our interlocutors. I think that approach will no longer, uh, appro uh, no, no longer work. Whether we resist the Chinese uh, presence, that is one way. Whether we ignore it and do what we are good at, that is another way. Whether we work with third countries to try to see how much you can slow it down, uh, that is a third way. I think we will try a mix of these different approaches uh, and the approach will vary from country to country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, may I uh, request Dr. Gupta to take the floor, please. Unmute yourself and respond to any of the questions you wish to. Thank you, Professor Monique. There were two uh, specific questions uh, addressed to me. One was uh, India blames uh, the neighborhood and neighborhood blames uh, India. What do I have to say on that? Well, I think uh, we have to get past that. And uh, that is what perhaps a uh, neighborhood 2.0 uh, is all about. There would be differences, but uh, this blame game, I think uh, uh, should uh, stop and uh, we should take a, a larger picture and a large number of uh, possibilities uh, were today identified uh, in uh, this discussion. So uh, while taking into account the differences uh, and uh, uh, the legitimacy, but uh, there is still the possibility of uh, uh, moving ahead. The second question was whether uh, Nepal can act as a bridge between uh, uh, India and uh, China. To that, I would say that uh, you have to really look at uh, uh, the uh, nature of uh, uh, Chinese challenge and uh, China's rise, how it has impacted uh, South Asia, how it has impacted India, how it has impacted Nepal, and so on. Uh, the answer to your question is that uh, I'm not very optimistic that uh, this is really the uh, right way of uh, looking at it. We have to uh, look at China and China's rise holistically. And uh, I think every country is uh, adjusting to it. And South Asia is uh, no... Uh, exception. Uh, and uh, uh, I did mention that uh, there are uh, shades of South China Sea in China's uh, behavior 
uh, towards uh, the South Asia. We hear that uh, Doklam Plateau has been, uh, their villages have uh, come up. We hear uh, in the media that uh, China has even built some villages uh, across uh, I, 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 in the uh, Nepalese territory also. I do not know how uh, correct that is. But certainly some villages are coming uh, along the line of actual control uh, in uh, uh, the uh, India-China uh, border. So these are uh, very uh, serious issues. And uh, I don't think we can ignore this while looking at uh, the uh, China challenge. Of course, uh, that is probably this will be discussed in some other uh, uh, segments of this uh, seminar. So I don't want to uh, uh, bellow that uh, too much. But, but uh, I just want to also just uh, pick up uh, this question of uh, strategic interest and ideology. I think strategic interests uh, uh, will remain very important and they will become even more important in the post-COVID world. So ideology, etc. you know, this was okay during the Cold War, but a lot of de-ideologization has taken place. And even in Cold War, ideology was being used to hide the strategic interest. So strategic interests will continue to define the nature, uh, the uh, foreign policies of uh, various countries. So strategic interests will remain important. And strategic uh, strategy is, uh, strategic uh, landscape is changing uh, for various reasons. Uh, which includes uh, the behavior of the nations, but also things like climate change and so on, other issues that have been uh, mentioned. I think Uttam has given some excellent ideas uh, of uh, moving forward. But uh, again, as uh, I agree with uh, Professor Muni, that uh, there are constraints uh, in uh, implementing uh, those ideas. So, uh, and one word about uh, India's neighborhood uh, first policy, I think neighborhood first policy, if you look at uh, it, uh, conceptual terms and the way it is, uh, uh, you know, being uh, uh, implemented, uh, one has to give kudos to the policy planners and I think they have uh, thought a lot. But where are the problem is the question of uh, implementation. Uh, that is where I think uh, if India has to, uh, you know, uh, earn its respect in South Asia, we must build our, on our own uh, uh, capacities. And my final point about uh, Raghun Nahi uh, talked about the, how India and uh, Pakistan uh, uh, are so different. Uh, I would say that perhaps the same can be said about India and China also. The interests between of India and China are very different. And uh, we saw one uh, glimpse of it uh, last year at uh, Galwan when they tried to change the uh, status quo unilaterally. And that has had huge uh, implications. And this will have long-term implications on India-China relations also. And my last point, absolutely the last point, and that is about uh, South China. You know, we are discussing South Asia. But I think many of you uh, have argued in the past that India cannot just be boxed in uh, a South Asia uh, uh, construct. And uh, South Asia uh, has to be linked with uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, West Asia, Indian Ocean, and so on and so forth. So India has to look at its policies, which go beyond South Asia. And even many of the uh, Indian neighbors, South Asian neighbors also are looking uh, at uh, other options. So I think South Asia, to that extent, is OK as a topic for a seminar. Uh, and uh, uh, also as a neighborhood first policy, it sort of fits in nicely. But uh, I think uh, we have to look at South Asia. Uh, India has to look at uh, broader uh, foreign policy. And I don't think uh, uh, China should be called or given an entry into uh, the South Asia, even if uh, hydrologically uh, some rivers uh, flow from there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay Bharadwaj. We, yes. in fact, wanted to start Q&A with you, but you were yes, not sir, there. No, go I'm, ahead. Unmute yes, un yourself sir. and go ahead. Sir, sorry, sir. I'm, I'm here now, actually. Yeah. I, I want to make uh, two, three uh, points on uh, issue Quickly, of water sharing, water sharing and energy cooperation. In fact, you know, I do see uh, Modi's two tenure in different perspective or different approaches that had been adopted. First, uh, first tenure was more focused about political economic issues that was addressing to non-traditional security uh, uh, issues. And the second tenure was more over with the political security where CAA or NRC or you can say uh, Kashmir and these issues were dominating and having implications 
on the neighborhood relations. But uh, the first tenure where Modi has emphasized, you can see that the uh, SARC summit, he has talked about the, uh, about the SARC uh, uh, power, uh, energy cooperation or power co uh, cooperations that he has come out that wanted to have a, a broader perspective or framework of cooperation in energy sectors. Let's have SARC grid uh, to, uh, to cooperate in energy uh, sector. And there, you know, India had come, uh, had, had been instrumental to develop a pipeline, oil and gas pipeline from Nomaliga to Bangla Banda. It is coming to Bangla Banda and then entering to Bangladesh. That can also be extended to Nepal that, uh, that th this kind of energy cooperation can be done. That India has also proposed to have uh, a terminal, uh, L LNG terminals in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Bangladesh or you can say in Bay of Bengal say that so that the uh, LNG or liquid natural gas make can the be points uh, professor Bhardwaj don't go into details no no I'm not I'm just talking that I think okay. what what was what was the approach of India in dealing with these two issues energy and water that India wanted to have a basin wise approach to address these issues in the water like uh, like in JRC meeting of 2010 Bangladesh has proposed to have a them in Nepal and that Nepal should be also in the boat of uh, managing river water so that you can address the environmental issues or climate change issues where salinity of water is increasing in the same manner that energy where Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal uh, and, uh, and they want to have co uh, cooperative mechanisms. I think that Modi wanted to have a, uh, this approach. Regarding China, I, I, I just want to make a brief point. In fact, th this, is a, uh, this is an issue that some of the neighbors, they are looking China as an opportunity and some of the neighbors, neighbors like India is also looking uh, China as a threat. So whatever the, I think there should be a regional approach to deal with China should be a, in the developmental board or should be have a common approach to uh, to involve China in South Asian countries. I think they should have a framework that how, where you can involve China uh, and where you can avoid, uh, where, where the bilateral uh, relations cannot be uh, ampered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of this panel discussion. I think we have covered all the important dimensions of India's neighborhood first policy. I would uh, at the conclusion flag three points which will continue to um, uh, you know, impinge upon neighborhood first policy. One is one has to deal with China, whether you like it or not. And this is not confined only to the BRI projects because the Chinese stakes are growing in South Asia. They are economic in nature, they are political in nature, and they are strategic in nature. And therefore the Chinese uh, have uh, started impinging in the cultural area of South Asia, in the economic area of South Asia. And also now politically, they are sorting out bilateral problems. They are sorting out intra-party problems, not only in one country, Nepal, even in, uh, to some extent in Sri Lanka, to some extent in Maldives. So let us uh, face that this is a challenge which Indian policymakers will have to cope with in one form or the other. Secondly, I think a very valid point made by Ambassador Puri of Ekla Chalo underlines that India's neighborhood first policy will have to be a mix of bilateralism as well as multilateralism. It cannot be either or. You know, most of the academic debate is caught between either and or that how can we have bilateral if we want to have multilateral probably the issues are so entangled that we will have to make both the approaches and thirdly and lastly i would say that india will have to focus greatly on the sensitivities of the neighbors and accommodating the neighbors that is how the vishwas or the trust would be regained and without regaining the trust no amount of uh, uh, very fascinating policies would really succeed. They would not come on the ground unless there is a mutual trust between the rulers, between the people, between the societies, and therefore the countries. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, for giving us this opportunity. And I'm greatly thankful to all the panelists who brought about excellent insights and various dimensions of the issue. Thanks, everybody. Distinguished uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. 
a sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching this live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session.